I just thought I'd throw up a slide since uh, we had a question uh, this morning uh, and talking about road deaths and something, and it said 34,000. It's not 34,000, it's actually gone all the way up to uh, 40,000. So I just pulled this from Wikipedia, and um, it's the sort of number that I actually follow is uh, what the road deaths are. So you can see it was, uh, you want to look at that, um, where it says total deaths is the third one down, so it's that sort of light blue one there. You can see that sort of around about the turn of the century, it was coming down nicely, and then we hit the Great Recession, it was nice and low there, and it started climbing up again. And you'll, you'll see some people in the uh, media say that, well, these uh, peaks in deaths is due to distracted driving. I've also read other people say that it's also due to the fact that after the, we came out of the recession, people were driving a lot more as well, but the, so it's probably a combination of the two. So I just thought that'd be interesting since that came Speaker up. Speaker is Alistair Adams, who needs no introduction. He's the angel of death. <laughs> there you go. I, I, but I'll introduce him in a minute when, when I'm when done. The rest of the team is oh, that's back easy, in yeah. the room. All right, so uh, thank you for returning after your lunch. Um, I, uh, I, I guess you have sort of figured out the, the hidden uh, message of all this, which is that I'm putting off self-driving vehicles for as long as possible. The elephant is in the room but still unacknowledged. I still want to deal with software that does things I believe software can do, uh, unlike driving cars, which I'm not at all convinced about. Um, the, the, the conversation of the morning having been about one aspect of the question of how to govern software and uh, with respect to user modifiability in particular leaves us asking some more questions about, well, how do uh, cars as a particular place to put software uniquely identify themselves one way or another? What is it that's special about the problems of software and cars if we leave that driving part out of it? So this next uh, uh, conversation is about the particulars of, of engineering systems that use software in automotive applications in particular. Um, Alistair Adams was part of one of the great Nordic free software experiments. There was a period of time in which the, the Scandinavian world was the unique proving ground of ideas about free software and uh, capitalism. Trolltech wasn't necessarily my favorite part of that experiment because it wasn't a GPL company at the, in the beginning. And the, the non-GPL licensing of Qt had vast implications in securing us diversity of desktops in free software operating systems, for example. Um, but, but from Trolltech, Alistair has done the job of riding with QT through a whole variety of places and times and is now, um, uh, a, 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 in addition to uh, Geneva and the, 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 the uh, sort of um, inter in the intra-industry consortium part of this story, also an old-time free software survivor in the automotive business, and it's that which I wanted to capture even more than uh, traffic deaths. So, Alistair, Yeah, please. okay. Thank you. So, uh, pretty honored to be here, and uh, I looked at sort of the agenda or sort of the overall topic and uh, sort of put together a talk which uh, I hope... Uh, meets talk to some of the diversity of the talks that you're going to get here so i'm going to give this a talk from uh, what our experience is in the open source and in automotive and uh, also talk about some of the, the economics of the uh, open source software as well and how we deal with it so i don't know i'll just say uh what what is uh, cute it's pronounced cute the i don't know how many people are familiar with cute I know some are, some might not be, so I'll just give you a quick overview. Um, it's called QT. Uh, the origins come from, uh, originally there was a toolkit called XT for building user interfaces, and that's still around a little bit. And um, so the, one of the original people liked the, the letter Q in the format, and so it became QT. And if you say QT fast, it sounds like a QT, and then you can abbreviate that to Qt. So it's a, a cross-platform application framework. Um, so what that means is that it's used for developing application software. So that's 
things that you user sees that can be run on various software and hardware platforms. So that's what the cross-platform means. So that's one of the nice things is you write your software once and it runs on Linux, Windows, Mac, embedded platforms, and so forth. forth. And so you can do that with a little change to the underlying code base. Um, I don't want this to turn into a marketing thing, but sometimes just a few pictures just gives you an idea of what it does. So these are where people use it on the desktop. These companies are using it there for cross-platform. Uh, it's used in tons of devices. It's, it's mind-blowing, all of them. So if you came here on an airplane and it had a screen on it, chances are it's running our software to do the display on that. Uh, and then in the car, uh, we're in all the cars, all the screens in the car is what we You'll, you'll see cute, not necessarily everybody uses us, but quite a few car companies. So that's the instrument cluster, and then that's also the cockpit. Um, we're not in the autonomous systems, which are controlling the car. So that's a totally different piece of software. I know there's a lot of discussion of that going on here. So I just wanted to set the context uh, for where we are. So when I looked at uh, the, the sort of agenda for what we're talking about, I just put it down here, and uh, just to go through it. So the question was about you know, how the software is governed. And I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. And then uh, users exercising their, their rights in that software and, and so forth. And, and, and again, that's a, a tricky situation. I think Daniel's already spoken to some of that and how we look there. Um, and so I'll try and talk to some of these uh, issues as, we go, as I go through the presentation. Uh, I think one of the things that here is that Qt, you know, we've been around for 25 years. It's, as uh, Eben mentioned, it's gone through a variety of different changes from Trolltech, which had one set of licenses. It transitioned to Nokia, which had uh, added additional licenses. And so what I'm going to do is just talk about what the motivations were for all these different licenses and, uh, you know, why they changed and what happened. And I think that's sort of insightful if you think about what the economics are of building uh, open source software. So just looking at open source software and automotive and, and what's the meaning of free? And uh, I think the term free is kind of gets a little bit controversial at times. You know, does it mean free as in B or free as the, uh, the freedom to actually go change things? So I think that when you're looking at the open source and automotive, the, the two main ones here, and uh, this is not the four that uh, down in the, the GNU manifesto, but um, I think the first one is the ability to be able to inspect the code. And for reasons that have already been discussed, you want to be able to uh, see how the code works. You want to be able to inspect to see if there are any bugs there and see if there's any malware. And so it's a one of trust. And then again, the freedom to be able to change the code so that if there is something that you don't like in there that you want to be able to change, you want that freedom too. Uh, and if there are bugs, you want that ability to be able to change that, uh, which sometimes you can't do. And that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is free of charge as well. And we'll come to more of that later. Um, so open source is really good. And some of the, uh, I'll con I'm going to talk a little real-world example I had with some proprietary software. And this goes back to the days when you know, I worked for Nokia. It was acquired by, worked for Trolltech. It was acquired by Nokia to build the user interface. So you spend a lot of time in a company that's trying to build uh, mobile phones. And for those that followed it, at some point there was this burning platform memo, and then uh, Nokia switched to using Microsoft uh, as a platform for its mobile phones. Uh, and I was well involved in the project which became MirrorLink, which is a mirroring technology like Android Auto and CarPlay, where you can get the, the uh, project your smartphone into the vehicle. But to do that, we needed uh, an extension to the uh, USB driver so you could run Ethernet over that, and we needed access to the frame buffer so we could actually send that over. Well. We couldn't do that. No one in Nokia could do that because we didn't have access to the source code. And it wasn't uh, on Microsoft's priority list to uh, implement that. So that feature never actually got implemented. So that's why open source is uh, really uh, beneficial to the industry. And that's why having these freedoms to be able to modify the code is really, really important. So what I'm going to do is just go through five different sort of use cases here. and types of economics of uh, open source and how it works and what the pros and cons are. You know, I think a lot of people, maybe more, more than the lay people, think that open source is people working in their basement for free in their spare time building stuff. Well, there's a lot of that going on. And you know, one example, I mean, I think Node.js started off like that. One person was sort of working away in his spare time and uh, doing something. But that, then when that became mainstream, it rapidly uh, became uh, sponsored by another company. 
And you know, there are lots of small projects, lots of add-on modules for Python. You know, I'm playing around with a little home automation system at home, and I'm using a lot of these modules that somebody's probably just written in their spare time. It's it's fantastic. It's great for that. And you know, it's also a great place for you know people who are new in the industry to come out and learn what good software looks like, and then to uh, contribute to something and uh, put out their trademark and uh, get noticed. And then you have things like OpenSSL. So OpenSSL had this thing called Heartbleed, which I'm sure everybody knows about. And this was code that was introduced in December 2011, and it was reported in 2014. And it turned out, you know, as uh, somebody commented, uh, you know, he said, think about it, you've got two full-time engineers uh, who are writing, maintaining, and testing 500,000 lines of code. And what I'm trying to get at here is, is that here you have the industry that's relying on all this, and uh, but there's only it's something that's severely under resourced. And uh, you know another quote from someone you know said it's not really you know, someone said the mystery is it's not that if, not that a few overworked volunteers missed the bug the mystery is why it hasn't happened already. And you know as someone said it's also may have resulted from failed economics. And if thinking of that, that it turns out that you know someone estimated that 50% of the servers in the world were relying on OpenSSL. So what the message here is is that yeah, open source is great, but you still need people behind it to maintain it. And soft, uh, open source, sorry, open source is good, but you still need people to maintain it and keep it going. Otherwise, you end up with problems like this happening. Then so you'll look at some of the other really, really big open source projects that are very successful here. And this is taken from the Linux Foundation, uh, where they did a survey of, uh, looking at the over a 12-month period, which were the, the largest projects. So they came up with the top 30. And these are 14 of them. And uh, you know, most of these are probably very familiar names. So if you look at some of these, you've got Google's doing three. You've got uh, React from Facebook and other big ones that's there from other big companies. And then you stop and think, well, what's the motivation for these large companies to uh, make invest in all this software and give it away for free? Well, in, in the case of people like Google, you know, and Facebook, they have to be they're making tools that they want their engineers to use to be more productive. And by putting these tools out into the open source, they're getting feedback from other people, other developers who are using them. Other developers will use them and learn from them. That in turn gives them more developers who know those tools. Uh, they get bugs reported that improves them, and then they also have a bigger source of uh, engineers that they can recruit from who actually know these tools and uh, can work for them. Um, you know, then other ones, uh, these companies also have different business models around it. So I think when we're thinking about the open source and the economics, it's, diff it's important to understand what's the motivations, the economic motivations behind the, all of these. Um, so a lot of other ones, another way that people will make money from open source is by uh, the consulting training and support. So just to quote the bit in there, you know, it says they do well because Hadoop is so complicated, there's lots of demand for training, consulting, and support. And, and so the question then is, well, this is a business model that probably works for software that's really hard to use. Now, our philosophy in building Qt is that we want to make something that's really easy to use and it's well-documented framework and it's fun to use and, in fact, you know, it, at one time, you know, one of the quotes we get back from many people is that writing software C++ and Qt makes it fun again. So that kind of business model doesn't really work for us. Um, and then there's also sort of like the, the moral obligations around uh, open source. So uh, you know, on the opensource.com, they've got the phrase, you know, you got the penny jar, so you give a penny, take a penny, and and then I was at a Linux Collaboration Summit, you know, and Jim Semlin said, well, the fantastic thing about open source, which is quite right, that is you take a lot and you give a little. Um, and then associated with that is the copyleft licenses, where if you do make changes, you're supposed to make your changes available to everybody else so that they can benefit too. And that's all great. But, you know, in our experience, there's a fair amount of uh, corporate avoidance of that. There's uh, a lot of co uh, corporations that will just take the open source and not contribute anything back. Uh, a part of that is the, the, the legal teams inside those companies aren't familiar with how to contribute things back, and uh, there's a lot of people believe that uh, IPR is, the, uh, is, is their secret source for everything. Mm -hmm. 
And then the, the last one I've got on the list is uh, the, uh, the consortium approach to uh, building open source. And in automotive, we've had uh, two alliances here, and uh, I'm sure Jeremiah knows all about the Geneva one. And uh, so it started off with really fantastic ideals. The, the point being is that, that a lot of the IVI software in there is commodity. Everyone has to build it. Everyone needs a Bluetooth stack. Everyone needs a uh, media player. So why don't we all just do it once and share it between all of us and uh, reduce the cost of everything? Well, the reality of that is partly due to the, uh, the business model and the relationship between the tier one suppliers and the OEMs is that the OEMs don't actually write the software. The OEMs are one of the probably ones that would really benefit from this, but they don't really write the software, although that is starting to change. And uh, the tier ones really were sort of afraid to give up and contribute things because they, they think, well, if I contribute something, is everybody else going to contribute from it, or will they gain more from it than I will? And they kept the, the feeling was that that was their secret source. So to me, I think uh, Geneva, uh, its biggest success really was raising the idea of uh, open source awareness within the automotive industry. Um, its goal to creating a baseline of a, a software for a, a stack, I think, didn't quite make it out there. Um, it's funny, I was just in a conversation with my, uh, my boss yesterday and we were talking about this, like you take BlueZ for example, and you'd expect that BlueZ is this open source blue, Bluetooth stack, and you would think everyone was using it. But everything I hear from back from people is, no, you can't use it because it's, the interoperability is not there. And that's you would have thought it would make sense for the whole industry to get together to do this, but no, everybody uses a proprietary stack instead. Um, that little diagram there is one from a few years back, but I think it's still valid in the Geneva uh, ideal. But the, the, the concept there was that um, you take, you've got the 80%, 15%, 5% rule. So what that means is 80% of the software is pure open source that you can take. Uh, the 15% is open source that you might modify, and the 5% is your sort of custom code. And that would be what's sort of in a, a generic uh, Geneva system. Um, so, like all things, there's competition. Geneva is very European-centric, uh, and then the Japanese came along and said, oh, well, we need something of our own, and so they created this thing called AGL, whereas Geneva is very specification-based. AGL uh, uh, said that code is a spec. Um, actually, I should probably step back. I think one of the reasons that Geneva went specification-based is that you did have this uh, so sort of conflict between people say, well, I've got my stack and someone else has got their stack, and okay, so well, why don't we just define the uh, APIs for that so that uh, we can have commercial components in there as well. Uh, I kind of like the idea that code is a spec. Uh, that's a bit of the, follows the Linus Torvalds uh, mantra, which is show me the code. Uh, what's interesting there is, uh, is a funny story there. Uh, they set their, me their membership fees at uh, half a million dollars a year. And uh, I sort of heard from one of the Geneva board members at the time that they all sort of looked at each other and thought, these guys are nuts. There's no way they're going to get that. And then all of a sudden, five members turned around. So five members were bringing in two and a half million, and Geneva had 130 members bringing in 3.2 million. So that was rather interesting. So from that, they're managing to actually starting to fund co uh, companies to actually build components for it. But I'm still left with a sense, you know, are the OEMs really serious about using it uh, internally? And uh, I think the thing that worries me is a, a lack of direct uh, requirements coming from the OEMs into that project. Uh, again, is it moving fast enough? And then there's a lot of work that Geneva's done that they're not picking up. So there was an audio manager that Geneva has that, uh, as I understand, is actually shipped in quite a few production vehicles. You know, my experience in software engineering is something that ships is way better than something that someone's redesigning again. But as we all know, uh, software is another form of religion, so you can't always persuade people different things. So I'm not convinced that a consortium is the best way to uh, build uh, open source for cars, because the two we've got here, are, they're not really convincing me that they're being very successful. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. So, with that said, uh, I think it might be interesting to just talk about you know, the history of where Qt's been and uh, the business models that we've had. So, it started off uh, as a company called Trolltech in 1993. Um, Eben, sounds like you know more of the history from, from the very beginning than I did, but uh, we can come to that. But anyway, it ultimately ended up being a, a commercial and GPL dual licensed uh, model. So that's GPL, not LGPL. 
And really, philosophy there was very, very simple. Uh, if you're making money building a product, product that uses Qt, then you should be paying us. Uh, if you're going to build a product that you're going to give away, then you can use Qt for free. And you know, if you're using GPL, it basically means that you're linking to those libraries that you have to give away. You have to make open the source code for your product as well. <coughs> so that worked really well. Um, our biggest competitor there at the time was uh, GTK. And the way I'd like to put it is that uh, whether or not we won the order depended on whether or not uh, it was the engineering manager that made the decision or the purchasing manager made the decision. If the purchasing manager made a decision, then it went to GTK because that was free. If it was the engineering manager that chose Qt because it was a little better than GTK at the time. So along came Nokia. They had a bit of a messed up uh, ecosystem with their Symbian phones, and it was really hard for people to write uh, code with it. We had all these beautiful little diagrams where we said, you know, four lines of code, you can do what you, uh, G, uh, the Symbian does in 20. Um, and this goes back to what I was talking about earlier. What are the motivations for it? Why does Google, uh, Google and uh, Facebook and, uh, and so forth have all their projects open source? Why did they give it away? It's a similar reason why Nokia did. They added the LGPLv2.1 license. The whole goal there was we want as many developers as possible using Qt because the more developers using it, the more bugs they find, the more performance improvements they find. That's a big benefit to Nokia in the end. And then when Nokia gets its smartphones out and its act together and starts shipping phones, there's going to be lots of developers out there who know how to write apps using Qt for the uh, Nokia phones. Um, and then there's another reason there, is that the revenue that we were bringing in, which I don't know, it's about 25 million, something like that, it was a rounding error on the balance sheet. Uh, an even funnier story there is that we were brought into the devices division of uh, Nokia and they had no mechanism for recognizing that revenue. So all that revenue went to some other completely different group. Um, I would say that by doing that, they effectively killed GTK. I mean, GTK is still around, but it's uh, nowhere near as uh, sort of more of a less, of a less than what it used to be. Uh, and the other thing is the number of paying customers halved pretty quickly, which is kind of what you expect. <coughs> so. <coughs> As you know, Nokia phones are no more, although they're reselling some under the brand. And they s basically, they sold everything off to Digia, uh, which was a Finnish uh, uh, services house around about 2012. And they still had the commercial and the LGPL v2.1 license. And then the attitude there was, please, please pay us. Can you please? Yeah, we need the money. And some did, some didn't. But, you know, there was limiting, limited funding there to be able to... Uh, drive Qt forward and improve it and make it better. Um, I have this little story here, you know, have you ever met an automotive purchasing manager? And uh, their job is to drive the cost down to zero. And uh, I kid you not, that's really true. We had one uh, deal where we were trying to negotiate with an automotive company and we were trying to negotiate the money and we gave in to everything, all their demands of what they said. And then they said, well, do we, you mean to say we can actually use this for free? And they said, yeah. So. They're using the open source version of for free. Now, the problem with that is that's part of philosophy. Though, but if every company does that, then Qt as a software tool is just going to wither and die. And then it becomes no use to anybody. Interestingly enough, there's one tier one we worked with. And they said, we've made a strategic decision that we're going to standardize on this product uh, because we think it's a great product. And we're going to pay for it because we want to invest in it. We want it to keep going. And we want it to keep uh, improving and getting better. So. There are, it's just interesting, different companies around the world have got different uh, viewpoints on things. And I think it's also important to understand there's a difference between the engineering managers who might believe what I just said about you know, wanting to make that investment, and then the purchasing people who've got different motivations, they're totally rewarded on how low a cost they can get for things. They don't care about you know, how the, the future-proofness of the company. <laughs> OK, so that was the Digia time. And those were the problems that we had, and we've you know, we want to make the, the product better. We want to improve it. We want to invest in it. And one of the things we did then was we did a switch to LGPL v3. And that kind of ties into all the TVOization discussions that we've had earlier. Because, uh, as Daniel says, the, you know, there's an aversion in the uh, automotive industry to using LGPL v3. So we're shamelessly uh, we're, uh, running off that one. And, uh, and it's, it's helping for that respect. So 
that's pretty much what we've got. We've got so we've got this combination of the open source and the commercial. And there's a couple of other things to that. You know, we've also got additional commercial only add-ons, which uh, is also another standard way of people making money from uh, open source projects. Uh, but we're also tied down by this thing called the the KDE Free Cute Foundation, and that comes back to the Evan's original story. Is so. One of the big benefits that Qt had right on the early days was that uh, the KDE Foundation, KDE wanted to use Qt as the uh, UI framework for the their uh, Linux desktop, and uh, they didn't like the original license, and I think that's when it came to GPL. Um, and so there's an agreement between Qt and uh, the KDE Foundation. Uh, which has actually survived from Trolltech to Digia to what's been now renamed as the uh, the Qt company, and they somewhat limit what licenses we can use. But basically, we have to stick to this LGPL license for most of the uh, core components of the uh, the Qt framework. Uh, and also, we're required to do uh, regular releases. So if we don't do any release within any within a 12 month period, then they have the right to uh, fork it and release it all under BSD. So that's sort of the uh, on the, the sort of the dirty money side that some people don't like talking about. Uh, on the more positive side, or different side, is on the governance. Is that we do treat this like uh, many open source projects. So uh, there was uh, when Nokia created the LGPL v2.1, we were looking for lots of contributions, and they we created the uh, what's called the Cute project, which still exists, and that defined uh, a governance model for how we run. So uh, that is documented on a wiki site. Um, looks pretty good. All the code that we have is all developed in a completely open repository. So we're following the more of the, if you've read the Cathedral and Bazaar, we've been doing more of the Bazaar model where even everything that's in the middle of being developed is out there in the open. Um, when you're committing codes, there's a bunch of approvers. If you're using Garrett, and you can find that list of approvers everywhere, and there's a mechanism for who becomes an approver and who isn't. Um, all the bugs tracking systems are in the open, although there are some ex some some are commercially sensitive, so we can hide those. Uh, list of maintainers, and uh, you know, there's a public developers mailing list. So all our communication that we have amongst our developers and all the other developers happens on this public mailing list. There is an internal developer mailing list, and there's virtually no traffic on it. So it, it really is everything's done in the open. So in that sense. Uh, we are developing everything open, uh, so you've got free access to the code and uh, and inspection of what's going on. So, sort of wrapping up here, um, you know, I think the open source is a fantastic benefit to everyone. We've already talked about that today. Um, the innovation that goes around it is is pretty amazing. Everyone benefits from it. Um, I think the point that everyone has to recognize, though, is that good software doesn't come for free. People are working for it. They need to be paid. So somehow, you've got to figure out some way of paying them. And there are different business models for that. Um, you'll find that big corporations give away their software. And they have different motivations around that. A lot of it is around they want control as well. And uh, if they can do that, that's great. I think it's important to recognize that some of the, some of the reasons for giving it away is a control one, too. Uh, and then the business model is going to vary depending on the type of software. You know, some build on services, some build on add-ons, some just give it away because they want to engage their developers. And there are corporations there who, you know, just take the software and don't contribute back. But there are also other ones that do contribute. So, and then. And, just as wrap up, you know, so we've chosen to use this dual commercial strategy, and so far it's working for us. Uh, so that's my talk. Thanks, everyone. Questions? Alistair, I, if, if the consortium model isn't the way to make software for common needs across the manufacturers, and if it's going to be hard for small dual licensing companies to avoid being driven to price zero by large purchasing manager oligopolies and the OEMs, how is this software going to be made? Well, I think it, it depends on the software, but I mean, I think for us so far, I think you're right, we're, well, 
we've gone with the LGPL V3, that's uh, stopping them driving it to, to zero, but you know, you guys are now coming up with strategies where they can use it. Ah, you see. This so, is my question. <laughs> so this is, is where is we'll it get really, tricky. Is it really that the software is going to be made by making people afraid of free software licenses? Is that how it's going to work? It's not the ideal one. No, I, I don't want to be your enemy. I mean, I want yes. the software to be made and I want it to be free and I don't want the one to be in conflict with yes. the other. Um, the, the, the advantage that, that comes from that uniform UI design is beneficial to everybody because when we get into car of type A, we don't have to relearn how everything mm -hmm. works on the screen. It all looks kind of uniform. And while it may be desirable to make it uh, possible for people to be aware whether they're driving a Volvo or a Ford, there's also reasons why you wouldn't want to make it impossible for people to drive one another's cars, assuming people are going sure. to drive cars. Isn't the, isn't the standardization of ergonomics a business model in itself? There are all those mm. design elements, all mm. those pieces which are particular to the people making the toolkit. Why isn't that a sufficient basis upon which to be part of the consortiums that make things? Because we provide well, human interfaces which everybody can understand. Well, I think we, well, I th we will, we've already got two different user interfaces on, the, on, on, on phones right now, which are different. And I think there's a benefit. If everyone, if everything, we had this discussion earlier. If everything is standardized, then you don't get any innovation around it. And letting it, we, well, first of all, I'll say that we, with our toolkit, we don't define what the user interfaces looks like. We give everyone the ability to define it however they want. So right now, I think it's great that each OEM can go around and uh, make their decisions on what they think the best user interface is. And I think we're starting to see a little bit of innovation now, especially now that some of, the, some of them are actually building it in-house. Um, let me just, I don't know how many people know how it works, but you, as I, as I, as I, illustrated earlier, the OEMs are typically spec houses. So they write the specification of what the software looks like, should be like. They send it off to an RFQ and they get various bids come in. They award it to a tier one. And then six to nine months later, the software comes back. And then you start to put it in the car. You take a look at it and you say, well, you know, that button's the wrong size and that color should be tweaked in shade. And then you say to the tier one, can you go change that? Well, they come back and say, well, that's a change request. You, know, you need some money for that. And so you have a negotiation, and you pay for it, and then you go back and forth like that. And after a while, you say, well, we've got to ship this car, and you're going to ship it regardless of what the state of the software is. And that, to me, is one of the reasons why the software in these cars is so bad from a user, user point of view. And if you look at the way that you design user interface software, it's highly iterative. You sit down with your designers and software side by side, and you try something out, and you see how it works, and then it doesn't work, you go back, you iterate it quickly. But if you've got a nine-month design cycle, you can't iterate it. So we're starting to see OEMs bringing this stuff in-house and, and doing some amazing stuff. And uh, you know, one of the uh, systems that was shown at CES this year was, you know, we had lots of people coming around saying that's the best system we've ever seen. So I think things like that are changing, and uh, that will certainly help that way. But, you know, and then the question. business model for Qt is it helps you to be more rapid and adaptive in your design when you bring it in-house. Yes. Oh, well, well, we well there is that. The, the, well, then, that why don't we just, well, then why yeah. don't we just GPL3 the whole thing and don't worry about it. You'll make a fortune. It'll be yeah. fine. Yeah. Well, you know, we have to adapt as things change. Indeed. And, and everybody does. Anybody want in? Does it work? Yes. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, do you, can you talk a little bit about the, as I understand it, you have, you, you lead the, the automotive, automotive uh, sector inside Qt. Inside yes. DJ. Yeah, okay. So, um, I, do you have any kind of visibility on, on the communities that form around, as I understand as well, it's, it's more, more about dashboards? Yes, right? it is, yes. Okay, so do you have any visibility on the communities that form around hacking those dashboards for customization purposes? Do you, do you support them? Do the automotive uh, industry support them as well? Is it mostly an underground thing? Is, does I, it exist? I don't, I'm not aware of any that are hacking that, to be honest. Uh, maybe that's my, uh, if there are any, I'd be interested to know. 
and maybe I'm not looking in the right places, but uh, I'm not aware of anybody hacking them, to be honest. Um, I, know, I know a few people have hacked into the uh, Tesla systems, just but there's more to see what's the, in there and how did it work. I don't think anyone's actually gone in and changed anything. Did you have an answer, Gustavo, as well as a question? Mm -hmm. It is the, sorry, yeah. Can you just provide some commentary on how liability laws apply to open source? Uh, well, that's an interest. Well, I, no, that's a very interesting one because um, you know, you know, when we go into a commercial agreement with uh, automotive companies, they all will ask for some liability. Yet, on the other hand, you know, some. Companies have been very happy just putting our software in there under the LGPL 2.1 and as is. So, you know, we're not involved in that from a liability point of view at that point. So, yeah, so clearly car companies are quite happy doing that. They don't worry about it. I find it, I find it if I can contribute just a, an idea to the, yeah, to the conversation. Please. Yeah. I find it interesting that people seem to, 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 to have a different view when we talk about the software from everything else that is in the car. I mean, it's not like people cannot change the mechanical parts of the car by themselves today, right? And those same people are also driving the cars. There's already laws that cover reckless behavior. So I think software, as software evolves and as we learn how to change it in a controlled way, I think my, my gut, you know, vague feeling is just that it's not so different, right? If you change your car, if you change the software of your car in a reckless way, it's it's similar to change your car, the mechanics of your car in a reckless way as well. It can cause damage. Right? Uh, I think you need to push a button on there. Uh, so, uh, I, I, if I understand correctly, you are talking about the dashboard, especially like the um, infotainment part. Correct. But how about the backend driving algorithm? So, do you think there's a possibility also to have an open source platform for that driving algorithm to merge every car manufacturer or software vendor's efforts? Sorry for the. You meant for the. For autonomous driving, did you say? Yeah, autonomous driving. If you, wait, if you wait just a few minutes, we'll bring you the people whose goal that is, and we can talk about that. Yeah, that's, that's probably better. That's the subject better. of our next session after these two. So we will, in fact, be talking about it. Yeah. Um, more for Alistair? All right, well, thank you. Okay, thank you.